Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the education panel for the Let Us Dream conference. We're so glad that you could join us this morning and we um, are really excited about sharing some of the things that we are doing and uh, in the area of community schools. So we will start, <clears throat> our program title is Schools After COVID, A Time to Heal. And I will give you a bit of an introduction to that. Um, but first I'd like to introduce the people on our panel today. And we'll start with Carrie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Bullock and I work at Broom Tail Gabosis as the Assistant Superintendent for Instructional Support Services and Leadership, working closely in partnership with our 15 component school districts in our region. Thank you, Carrie. The next, um, Matthew, if you would um, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt McCon. I'm an associate professor and chair at Binghamton University, uh, the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Educational Leadership. Thank you, Matthew. Um, can I just call you Matt? Please. Okay. Um, next on our list is Doug Overton. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Doug Overton. I'm uh, currently the co-founder of an educational group called Ed Tomorrow that provides uh, high-level SEL content to educators across the globe. Great. Thank you. Um, James? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James Reese. I'm a community schools coordinator for the Union Endicott School District. I'm stationed in an elementary school, Angie McGinnis. Great. Thank you, James. Joanne? Good morning, everybody. I'm Joanne Sexton. I am the superintendent of Whitney Point Schools, and I'm happy to be with you this morning. Okay, thank you. And a quick introduction to my to me is uh, I'm Patricia Follett. I was the former superintendent of Whitney Point Central School District, and I am the moderator for today's session. And I get to ask all the questions, but don't have to have any of the answers, which is a great position to be in for once in my life. That's part of being retired. So um, our conversations today, I know they said that most people read the uh, booklet, but sometimes, in my opinion, these conferences get a little, what am I looking at? What are we thinking about today? So when we were looking at what we would be doing for this section of the education panel, we <clears throat> talked about the, the impact or some of the negative impacts that COVID had on our educational system and really looked at how it might have magnified the deep inequities in the system and really left the education system in a bit of a crisis. Uh, the impact on learning has affected students, but most severely those already the furthest behind. Across the, the country, students have gone missing. We don't necessarily know where they are. Uh, many are attending school, but are disengaged with high levels of physical, social, and mental health needs. Uh, the shortage, which uh, Joanne and Carrie and Matt I, I can attest to, the shortage of administrators, teachers, bus drivers, um, all staff is incredible with a burnout rate that is at an all-time high. Uh, schools are under attack for curriculum choices. Books are being banned from libraries and classrooms. Communities and families are divided politically, stifling healthy discourse. And to add to that trauma is a constant reminder of the threats and fear of school shootings. It, and we decided that it's time for us to talk about, um, it's what, what are we doing for this healing process? And then uh, although COVID-19 has turned our educational world upside down in a short period with devastating effects, there are still many reasons to as Dr. Bentley said, to remain optimistic. That optimism is good for our brains. Our panel will provide current efforts to counter the pandemic's adverse effects and to share ideas and actions, which are important. Ideas are great, actions are what we um, see and do to support our educators, our students, our families and communities to become healthy, engaged and thriving environments. So um, we have some questions and I'll be addressing some of the panel members. They'll be giving their, you know, giving us information and ideas and actions of what they're doing. So the first question is, one reason for optimism is the significant federal funding recently allocated to educational institutions. Can you talk about how you see this funding being used to build an equitable and excellent education for all students especially those that are furthest behind. So I'm gonna start with Carrie Bullock 
And um, Carrie, you work at a New York State Board of Cooperative Education Services, better known in New York as BOCES, which as you said, serves 15 regional school districts, BOCES school, schools, and um, you were a little kind when you said only 15, because I know you work with other districts around the state. So how do you see this funding affecting the kind and volume of services that the BOCES provides? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, and so just, I wanna start with a little bit about BOCES to just be able to give some history about why my response is the way it is. So uh, Board of Cooperative Educational Services, and I'll stress Cooperative Educational Services, and that means that districts pull together to share in services. Um, and the benefit to that is, is one, we can collectively learn together. And two, um, districts financially receive uh, New York State BOCES aid for the services that they participate with, with, with us. Um, with the federal funding available, uh, that's impacted us in different ways. Um, the federal funding isn't used directly in BOCES services because um, they wouldn't receive aid on those services, but what the federal funding has allowed for our districts is to uh, purchase some additional resources, whether that be in physical resources, programmatic resources, staffing, uh, to be able to support their efforts in their schools, uh, which in, in some ways has shifted our work a little bit, um, that we can partner and work alongside uh, and partner in different ways. Uh, we've increased our services in the area of instructional coaching tremendously. Um, so that we have staff who are there in districts supporting teachers and utilizing various resources. Um, we've also seen increases in our services, uh, specifically in community schools. Uh, we had a community school service supporting um, just a small number of districts uh, before pre-pandemic, and that's now expanded to supporting a team of 12 community schools coordinators, James being one of them, who's out in our district supporting their work. Um, and so that has been uh, something that we see as uh, an area of continued growth to support the varied needs. Um, we've also seen a need in uh, developing new services. Uh, districts have shifted funds slightly to be able to free up funds to uh, purchase new services that we might be able to support them in. So for example, um, we have five districts who have asked us to support them in their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in their districts. Uh, and so we've added staffing to support those specific needs. Um, and then finally, I would say, you know, the, the federal funding is has been a nice opportunity for districts to be able to uh, provide additional resources, but ultimately uh, that is not gonna be there in the future. And so, you know, we're thinking about ways that we can continue to partner with organizations who are in our districts and with our districts to think about ways to sustain these models moving forward. Um, because the districts do receive aid when sharing these services through BOCES, uh, it's a way to think about sustainability moving forward. Uh, and whether that be in a community school strategy or enrichment services, or we're working with the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Educational Leadership on a potential teacher residency program, um, all of these opportunities to think about models for sustaining the services when, when the federal funding is no, no longer available. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, next, Matt, as a professor and the chair of department of the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Educational Leadership, fondly known as TLEL, at Binghamton University, how is this funding providing new opportunities for your Binghamton students and collaborations with school districts to support students affected by the pandemic? Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Pat. Um, I, can everybody hear me okay? Um, I, you know, I think that um, uh, uh, Carrie alluded to it there in the end there when we're talking about a residency program that we're kind of working towards. Um, but when the need um, initially came out, even before the funding, uh, you know, we were in a position with student teachers to be able to, you know, provide certain tech support that was going on during COVID. And what we've seen is that has now that that is over in the pandemic, well, we're on the on the, the tail end of that. Um, you know, what we learned in that tech support 
um, arena has been invaluable. And um, the other thing that has come about is, you know, how can our students provide the type of staffing support that is lacking at this point um, right now? You know, the Binghamton, you, you know, because we're a master's program, that puts us in a very unique position. You know, these are students with um, uh, uh, with BAs, and so they're, they, they've got a little bit more leeway in what type of work they can do in the schools. Um, and so what we did was, is what we created in the inaugural year of, we called it a fellowship, um, and worked with, um, with districts to create MOUs that would put the students in the schools for five days a week, uh, while also uh, getting their internship hours. And the districts paid in for those uh, into fellowships that came through the Binghamton University that went directly to the students. Um, and that, that offered um, you know, support around uh, substitution. That was, a, that was a big issue that I know the schools were, were, were having. And so we were able to offer that. Small group instruction. Um, I know that some of the districts also utilize the students to do data analysis and then implementing um, some of, or hitting the gaps in the areas that they were seeing in that data analysis. Um, and so there was a, you know, we're, and, and this has been an evolution, you know, Carrie and I and, and Andrea have been working and a couple of other um, people from BOCES uh, were kind of in this inaugural year and putting together a residency to get the certification to have this model so that this once fellowship that started with uh, the funding that came through can now be sustainable as a, as a um, dare I say, COSER, isn't that right, Carrie? <laughs> right, that we're creating with BOCES uh, in, a, in a residency um, certificate and a partnership with the districts. Um, you know, so far, I think we've seen some, uh, we're trying to hit the glitches that we're seeing, and I think we're learning as we go. I think the most exciting part about it has been um, the attending teachers that are working with the cooperating, or excuse me, the attending teachers that are working with our students. Um, they're getting, um, you know, uh, they're getting uh, reimbursed for this at a, at, um, you know, at a rate that's a lot better than our cooperating teachers normally do because we're asking a lot more out of them. And in that process, we're learning how to collaborate with the districts. Um, better than I, I've ever seen before. We just had a most recent meeting and the information that was shared in terms of what the teachers are seeing our students need and what we wanna see out of the teachers giving to them um, has just been a, a collaborative success by all measures. And um, so it's, it's, you know, this funding has provided um, not only uh, a partnership, strengthening a partnership, but also um, PD that I think is going to, to sustain itself moving forward. Great. That sounds extremely exciting. Um, the, the idea of the collaborations, the experience that your students are getting, and in addition, a way, as Carrie had said, to how do we then take this funding, this opportunity we've been offered, and build sustainability into it um, is, is fabulous. Thank you so much. Uh, Joanne, I'll go next with you. Um, as superintendent of a poor rural school district, how has this funding been used in yours and maybe possibly some of the ideas you've heard in other, um, other people using in their districts as a superintendent? So, yeah, I mean, so we are a district that has a high percentage of families that with, have limited financial resources. And we also are a rural school district, which certainly presents challenges. But I like to think that um, those things that have maybe perceived as obstacles has long forced us to think outside the box and try and come up with different ways to do things. Um, and we've certainly had to do that through this uh, pandemic and post uh, whatever stage we're in now, I, I would like to say post pandemic era. Um, in our district, and I think in many districts, we've seen that the details of how the pandemic has played out is really very individual because the disruptions, because of the way things were managed, um, manifested different experiences for different students. So we, for example, had students who were home entirely for a year and a half, and we had some students who were hybrid, and we've had some students who were here as much as they possibly can, especially especially our elementary students, but still experienced repeated quarantines, may have been sick themselves, may have lost loved ones. Um, it, it is just not one single uh, problem. So we've had to sort of have this multi-pronged approach. And I think that, you know, across districts that we've all had to do that. Um, some of the things that we've done specifically is we've 
higher teachers to maintain lower teacher student ratios. We provided more targeted invention, uh, interventions and um, uh, special ed support services to make sure, as you mentioned, Pat, um, that the students who could least afford to um, often were the same students who had the most interruption to their educational experience. Um, so we really tried to target those students. But then even other, other students, just the whole experience, has, it has derailed them in a different way. Um, the loss of connection to the school um, is really, really significant for a large uh, percentage of our students. And when we talk to them or we survey them, they, they very clearly say that. It sort of made them feel like they lost their way um, and, didn't, and all of a sudden it didn't really make sense to them. So we um, have increased our mental health supports. We have um, added a community school coordinator um, to our existing community school coordinators to increase supports to families and, and um, students. We've also uh, increased the, we, we have always done this as a district, but we have really tried to foster our relationships with other agencies to make sure that we have you know, support services that are accessible to families in our rural school district and um, increase our summer learning opportunities to, again, have fewer disruptions and have more enriching continuous learning opportunities for students. We've also invested in a, um, a building project so that our, our pre-K-4 program can have more consistency um, and all of our four-year-olds four will be on our campuses. Um, we've also, uh, as has been mentioned both by Carrie and um, Matt, we, at the same time that all this has been happening, have had huge disruptions to our workforce um, because of absences, because of quarantines, because of illnesses, but also just because there's a shortage of people um, who are looking to work in school. So our partnership with uh, Matt and you know, moving forward, hopefully after these funds are gone with, with Carrie and our BT BOCES, um, is something that has become really important to us. Uh, the, this program, you know, which we, in our district we call the, the apprentice program, um, uh, it is, has been um, really just profoundly impactful in making sure that we have consistency for our students. It is, you know, the theme of this, uh, this day is really about coming together and uniting in divided times. And that, that relationship has been key. Um, also, our, ag our agencies in our area that have worked together and, and collaborated with us and SUNY Cortland also we have a relationship with because uh, it's nearby our district, and they also have had their students here working in our district too and that's been really, really uh, powerful for our students. Thank you, Joanne. Um, sounds like there's a lot going on there and again looking at the relationships is, is amazing and the work we've been able to support. Um, Doug, you are one of the supporters um, when we're talking about all of this work. Uh, with your work from community schools and restorative practices, uh, please share how you've seen this funding being used and how it's affected you. I think it included a move from Texas. Um. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So I'm kind of on the reverse end as the uh, from the other panelists, and uh, there's definitely reasons for optimism when we think about these COVID funds. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with several rural districts here in uh, upstate New York that utilize these funds to bring in uh, restorative practices and to bring in SEL trainings to support their districts. Um, when you think about these supports, I think what they did was they opened the door uh, to give students a voice coming back from. COVID, um, we've we've definitely seen um, kind of kind of a miss amongst our students when it comes to social socialization and uh, restorative practices and SEL practices uh, really came in and, and so many schools across the area use those COVID funds to um, to support their students, to bring them back uh, and to give them a voice in this area. Um, and, and I think honestly, if, if it wasn't for the COVID funds, um, a lot of the rural districts that we've worked with wouldn't be able to, to use the, the funds in this particular way. Um, and so, and I know that many schools across the area kind of share that particular sentiment as well. So uh, the, the funds have been a huge game changer uh, for schools. Okay, great. Uh, we are gonna move on to question two. Uh, is there anything anybody would like to add from this panel um, uh, about question one and the funding? Okay, great. So um, question two is our keynote speakers discussed how you are how humans react to change and pressure and how our brains respond to trauma and stress. 
And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that um, in a little while too, after this session. We see an increased dropout rates unaccounted for students and many students and families that are disconnected from each other and their school communities. Please discuss efforts to out counteract the trauma and stress caused by the pandemic, how to re-engage students and families and the work to heal schools and the larger community. And James, I'm gonna start with you. As a family advocate, which is the way I got to know you through the Department of Social Services, where you were uh, implanted in our school district in order to prevent people from um, becoming uh, reported cases. And now as a school coordinator, you've worked with many disconnected families and students. Please talk with us about your efforts and your success with <laughs> students, families, and the community. Okay, uh, so I'll go back to when, uh, you know, COVID first happened back in March of 2020. That's when I was working in the Whitney Point School District. Um, I try to find positives out of everything. I think with COVID, it did make us come more together as, as a community. Um, and it made us realize like that some of these families that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it made us realize that there's, you know, there's more that they need that is on the surface, I guess. So um, I'd go to these homes and I would basically just say, hey, what can I help you with? And whether that be food, clothing, I think with, with COVID, we really got to see what these families really needed. Prior to COVID, we weren't really, I guess, going out to the homes that much. So, um, you know, with all these deliveries and stuff, we really got to know the families and they got to know us. And it made, it, it made us show that we really cared for them. Um, so that was a positive I wanted to talk about. And I guess what I wanted to say was, um, Doing what I do is just, I always tell people I have the funnest job at any job I've ever had. And that's one thing I like to do with these kids. I just want to have them come to school and make school fun for them. Um, I know when I was in school, I didn't have anybody that was in my role. And I wish, I always hear people t tell me, oh, I wish I had someone like you to, when I was in school. And so that's uh, what I wanted to say, I guess. I don't know if I particularly answered that question, but <laughs> It's great. I wish I had someone like you when I was in school too. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he, James is a bit shy in, in promoting himself, but as I said, he's one of the bravest people I've ever met because he would, um, without any kind of um, thought, go out and meet with some of the, in some of the places and some of the families that really were disengaged and hard to reach. And it was uh, really wonderful to see how he could bridge the school and the community. Um, and it, it really um, was, a, was a beautiful thing. So thank you, James. We'll hear a little bit more from you later, but um, Doug, we're back to you. And um, a focus on your work um, has been a bit different, but uh, please add to James's comments about ways of healing based on the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't think there's a way to sugarcoat this. Like COVID has done a number on, on education, the educational system in general. Um, I, I think one of the biggest things it did is it further exasperated this pre-existing condition, uh, the lack of growth of socialization uh, due to digital media consumption. And, and we've seen this in our, uh, in our, in our students. Um, we spent a year at home on screens and, and our, that has impacted our kids in, um, in profound ways and really challenging ways for educators. Uh, I remember being an educator uh, in the fall of 2020 and when our kids came back into the school system, um, it just felt different. It felt different than it ever had before. Um, and I, I racked my brain thinking about like, what are ways that we can re-engage our students? What, what, what are some Tri some tricks or some strategies uh, to start to uh, bring these kids back into some normalcy and some relationship building activities. Um, and that's when I, I launched this idea uh, called the, the first five. Uh, and the first five, the idea of it's it's fun, it's quick, it's easy relationship building strategies 
um, to hand out to teachers to ultimately allow our students to feel seen, to feel heard, and to feel valued. And that's what I think our students really needed coming back from COVID is um, to, to have that sense of normalcy, to be able to connect with their classmates, not in front of a screen, but um, in, in person. And, and that was the goal. Um, and so as we, we shared out th this process to, uh, to educators across the country, um, it, it, I've really been excited to see us as we come back to uh, a little more normalcy, I guess, and what we call a post-COVID society, uh, we, we've seen this tool impact over 300,000 students uh, across, the, across the globe. And that's all through a lens of human connection, a lens of self-care and caring for others, and a lens of character development. Um, and so those are ways that we're trying to re-engage schools and school communities, which I think is uh, so important during times like this. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, and I think we're hopefully going to hear a little bit more about restorative practices and maybe some of the other questions. Um, that's exciting work. Um, so, Carrie, uh, you provide professional development and coordination of services. Please share with us the exciting work that you see happening in response to trauma and stress. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the important things that I want to stress before getting into some specific examples is I think, you know, you, Pat, you just said a coordination of services. I think partnerships has been huge to be able to support the various needs of our students. Um, during this time, you know, during the pandemic, I think we all had to rely on one another and work more collaboratively together. And so we have seen um, some really nice increased partnerships. Um, with Binghamton University and various departments, uh, with our school districts, with Broome County Mental Health, um, with statewide organizations, and really just trying to serve as a hub to be able to bring those things to our region uh, is, is a place where we have been. And so some examples of that, um, you know, I mentioned the expansion of our community schools service in partnership with Binghamton University community, community schools, and James spoke to some of what that work has been looking like in districts, um, and, and really just being able to support that team of coordinators out in districts who are meeting the various needs of students and families in different ways based on district needs, um, but coordinating the service around that to be able to equip them with anything that they need to be able to do that role. Um, another example of how we've come together as a region, really this was at the request of our superintendents from our various districts, um, was we just recently developed a regional crisis team model. Uh, we're just getting started. Um, but we knew that we have, with all of the trauma that everyone's facing, we have experienced some really significant crises in our region. And we have to work collaboratively together to uh, support one another, to learn from one another, and so this team just uh, was pulled together at the beginning of this school year. And I'm happy to say that we have all 15 districts and our BOCES participating and representing um, their districts at the table, which is not always the case. And But we know that this is a great need. Um, and so again, we're just getting started in this work, but um, I think it's going to result in some uh, resources and processes that we can put into place. Uh, to support one another in the areas of prevention, intervention, and postvention when we think about uh, traumatic events that happen in our schools. Uh, the last thing that I'll just mention is around um, some of our statewide connections. Um, we, in our position at BOCES, we work closely with our uh, state, state education department. Uh, there's been a lot of updates recently. Uh, actually, earlier this week, our the social emotional learning benchmarks for New York State were updated. Um, so we have new uh, digital fluency standards. I think about what Doug mentioned and, and the amount of screen time and what that does for us. And so all of these resources that are coming out statewide, our team um, tries to bring those supports to our districts about what does this mean? What does this mean in terms of implementation and working with regional and statewide groups to, to kind of be that connector? Um, and so I think those are just a few of the examples of, you know, how we're working together with various uh, organizations with our districts to really uh, support the mental health needs um, and those affected by trauma in this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Joanne, at the district level, 
uh, you're tracking data, making sure there's supports are in place uh, to address these issues. Would you please talk about district efforts to counteract the trauma and stress caused by the pandemic and uh, heal the school and the larger community? So the, the impacts of trauma and stress um, have impacted the entire school community. Um, I mean, I, honestly, almost every day we think we find or realize that another thing that we're seeing or witnessing or experiencing is, is resulting from the stress and trauma over the last couple of years. Um, some of the specific things that we're doing, just as far as data, you, you know, you asked about that, you know, we're utilizing surveys, regular meetings um, with faculty and staff, uh, ongoing input platforms so that we can get feedback from everybody um, in our school community. Uh, we track more traditional data like attendance. Um, attendance has been a really significant concern. You know, kids got out of the habit of being in school. Um, and so getting back in and realizing that every single day is important to be here um, has definitely been a concern. Um, academic progress and behavior, obviously we're tracking also to make sure that we are in tune with like the wellness of the whole um, student body and the faculty and staff and families. Um, we're, some specific things that we've done, and again, this all speaks to partnerships and, and how, how essential that has been. Um, we were fortunate enough to be part of a, a Care Compass Network grant last year. Pat, you, you certainly know this, um, where we were able to provide comprehensive training to, in our elementary school over the course of a year um, on trauma-informed approaches in our school system. And that was uh, the entire school community. So we were really attending to the stress and the trauma that uh, uh, the adults in our school community were experiencing, the children certainly, and then um, and then families to make sure that we had like a tiered approach to that and we were being really thoughtful in our practices. We've also included in a more general way across the district training on trauma-informed process approaches, something that we've talked about for years, but really trying to give people tangible um, examples to, to, to be aware of their own trauma and stress, and then um, to make sure that our school environment is sensitive to all of those things. Um, we've had uh, Doug's partner worked here in our district and we uh, did restorative uh, uh, practice training um, with all, in all of our buildings. Um, that was very, very meaningful for, for um, the way we uh, structure school. We've offer, also offered many um, self-care opportunities for our faculty and staff, and we continue to monitor what is gonna meet their needs um, because the work that they do every day is essential and they need to be well and feel supported. Um, so we uh, you know, try to really be attentive and responsive to where they are um, as time progresses. We also in, uh, increase our um, EAP program. Um, and then one of the things that, that Carrie just said, that, you know, that, that that this whole thing has brought us together as a region and we and our, our collaborative efforts have increased inside districts. I know that this is true in other places, but here we've really tried to emphasize to people that they are part of something, that we are together, we are in this, we are here to support each other. Um, because when it's hard, um, you have to feel like you have purpose and um, you're not alone. And so that has been a, a very consistent theme that we should at every opportunity we can, we really try to communicate to everyone. Um, I, you know, we certainly don't have an answer. What we've learned through this last couple of years more than ever is that there is no answer, um, that we're talking about human beings in, in a changing landscape. So we are constantly need to be attentive and listen and, and don't think that we know, like, you know, what is the one recipe to fix things. Um, we have to be responsive and work together as a community um, with students, listen to where they are, listen to the experiences that um, Doug just mentioned and Carrie just uh, uh, reiterated uh, with living so much of their li life online has been profound. And that is changing all the time for them. So we have to really be attentive to what's happening to make sure that we are, are um, making sure that our efforts are, are relative and relevant to what uh, is happening in our world. Okay, great. Thank you, Joanna. It does sound like there's a lot going on and we know how important it is for people to know that people that they're cared for and that people are caring and that they're important. So it sounds like there's a lot going on and a wonderful climate and culture amidst this uh, COVID aftermath and continuing a bit of that optimism that we talked about that's so good for our brains. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, is there anything else any panelists thought of or wanted to respond to before we move on? 
Okay, great. So question number three. Across the country, school districts are implementing new strategies to support student learning loss stemming from COVID-19 disruptions. How are you making decisions about programming and finding the balance between academics and social emotional well-being? And this question is based a little bit on um, Obviously, whatever happens, there tends to be a bit of criticism that there's a focus on one to the other, too much, too little. Um, as Joanne, I think, just said that there's um, every school district individual is a little bit different and we need to respond in ways that are appropriate for everyone. But how are we as in your organization or in the community that you're working in, how are you seeing this balance or finding this balance between academics and social emotional well-being. And Joanne, I'm going to um, know you just got done talking, but um, I'm going to ask you to address that first. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, you know, again, I can speak for our district, but certainly I'm in communication with the other districts. So I don't think that it's that different, although I think our district, and, and in truth, it's the reason that I have worked here all of these years. And um, We've always been acutely aware of the necessity of attending to social emotional well being um, because you can't be academically successful unless you have a safe uh, and a learning environment and that you feel well as a human being. Um, so we've always had kind of a holistic approach to educating. Um, and so there is always, you know, this dual effort between attending to the to the to the social emotional needs and act in, in support and and in tandem with attending to good instructional practice to make sure that um, the the educational experience in an academic sense is is at the level that it needs to be. Um, we certainly uh, don't, again, I will say the same thing I said just a few minutes ago, we don't have a perfect solution or strategy. Um, we have found over time that we need to, uh, again, listen. Um, we need to always make sure that we're in tune with how students are doing because it changes literally month to month. Um, there's so much divisiveness and, and, and volatility in the greater world right now um, that influences students through the things that they're hearing, the things that they see online, what their, what their families are listening to and, and hearing that impacts the way they see school or see themselves in the school environment um, that we have to be, I mean, I, I can't, I tell you like, it, you know, people talk about how things change so much more quickly now. I mean, it is truly amazing that we have to just be constantly in tune to what's happening and try to focus on coming together over the thing with on the things that matter, and not get caught in the the um, the you know everything that has become so contentious out in the world and polarized. So, what we've been trying to do as a district is, and this is with our greater community also, is to come back to the place where we remember what this is all about, the places that we have a shared interest, and not get caught in the politics of things, and just every single adult in the school community wants the children of this community to have a safe learning environment and to be academically successful. So we just try to focus on the things that make that happen um, and, and the well-being of the children that we all love and care for um, and to not get into this battle of is, you know, what, what's SEL and should that be in school or should, it's just about safety and security and dignity so that we can, we can have successful students here in our school district. Okay, thank you so much. Um, learning more and more every second. Um, Matt, as we move on to you, how is this being addressed at the university level? Um, I know, Possibly, I know this, the students that you are, not only the students you have placed in schools, but the students that you have attending the university have also experienced this trauma and had, you know, their education brought to a grinding halt and moved to uh, online learning and teaching and, you know, all of, all of that, and they're being placed in these environments. So can you address what your thinking and actions are at the university mm -hmm. level? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think there are the two things come to mind, um, and then a couple of things that kind of are optimistic around that. Um, uh, first, the learning loss at the at the student level, we are seeing districts utilize our apprenticeship uh, students in looking at you know the data and where the the loss is and how they can do more small group instruction to to direct 
um, uh, to directly um, fill in those gaps. At, at the university level, um, there's, there's a lot, um, but, but I'll give you one that really is gonna impact schools. Um, you have to remember, you've got a whole cohort across the nation that didn't get traditional student teaching. Um, and so you now have, uh, you know, a lot of the conversation that's at the, the SUNY deans and directors meetings that I attend um, uh, uh, twice a year, you know, are around how are we um, getting the information and uh, collecting data on how those teachers are succeeding in the classroom, um, you know, because they're clearly not prepared uh, the way that they should be. Um, you know, many of them, they're you know, ed TPA at that time that was, was waived because nobody could get into a traditional classroom setting. And so a lot of them were teaching online. A lot of them never really got to get in front of a classroom until they started a job. Um, and so, you know, uh, that is something that we're, that as, uh, just as a system, we're going to have to address. Um, the, uh, you know, there, there have been some, um, some optimism around this is, uh, a lot of the research that I do um, involves video, and uh, you know I came from. Uh, if I if if I'm not mistaken, did I hear Doug? You're a fellow Texan as well. Uh, yes, all right. I came from Houston. Go Astros! Uh, good thing I can't see all the Yankees fans on this thing. Um, but uh, the the uh, in Texas we did a lot with video, and you know they don't have unions down there. So there's, you know, you can do a lot more in those schools that when I moved here, I, there's a lot of, you know, uh, I got a lot of pushback. Um, Ed TPA kind of allowed that door to open up a little bit more because it required video. And now with the pandemic, we're seeing it, it's a, it's a lot easier. Um, and so uh, we're, we're working on collaborative effort or collaborative uh, web platforms like Sibme and GoReact that allow um, supervisors, university um, supervisors, cooperating teachers, and students to all view and comment on teaching that's happening. Um, and so that's one optimistic thing that's kind of, uh, kind of, uh, you know, in, in talking about, I know we're not dealing with students with learning loss, but that has improved the practice of training teachers. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there are some things that came out of that. Um, like I said, uh, I do think it is going to be interesting as this data comes in on these teachers, uh, you know, we call the, the, the COVID graduates um, and see what that looks like. Thank you. It's interesting that during the COVID, they got less time in classrooms and now your students are getting more time in classrooms with all of the collaborative efforts. Um, very interesting. Um, maybe hopefully some of them got a little bit of both. I don't know. <laughs> um, so thank you, Matt. Carrie, how is this being addressed at the uh, regional level, this balance between the social, emotional and well-being and the academics and making sure, I mean, one obviously we know leads to the other, but um, how, how are you seeing that happening at the regional level? Yeah, I, there's been so many good things mentioned. You guys, you're making me all think about so many things that, um, connections that I have. And, you know, I'm just gonna speak to a few of the things that um, I, think we've done intentionally to really keep the balance of both. Um, coming back to some of our partnerships, there's been some really nice opportunities that came out of those. Uh, one specific one uh, has been a, a grant that Binghamton University actually received a United Way grant that pulls in the School of Social Work and our uh, teaching, learning and ed leadership to partner with our team to address some specific literacy needs of students and an opportunity for those students and families to receive tutoring uh, who might need them. And our team will be working with um, students in the School of Social Work and others who might be identified as tutors to equip them with the skills that they need to tutor. Uh, and that has been a great partnership. And I can just see those types of things moving forward uh, as a way to address really where, where the student and the families are and also they're supporting their academic needs, especially as we're partnering, partnering with the School of Social Work. Um, I think, you know, I was thinking about what Matt had said about the preparation that our teachers had had and the loss of that during the, the pandemic. And it was making me think about um, a shift that we made this year to supporting new teachers in three of our school districts, Whitney Point being one of them. Um, we've had a lot of new teachers hired and making sure that they are equipped with what they need to support 
the students' social emotional learning, mental health needs, and their academic needs. So we created a new teacher institute um, for these new teachers, which is much more intensive professional development than they would have had in the past, starting with the summer institute, regular days throughout the year with some intensive coaching in their classroom to get immediate feedback. And I know from our team's perspective, they feel like it's been really helpful because they're there and can give that specific feedback to new teachers where they might need that to be able to support the various needs of their students. Um, I will also say, I mentioned earlier that we expanded our team uh, in the area of really supporting mental health and social emotional learning. And one thing that's been really important for us is bringing together those specialists with our specialists in content areas and those who have always focused on standards, curriculum and instruction, because that historically was where our work really lived. Um, bringing those teams of, of specialists together, learning from one another. So we're all speaking the same language and thinking about really supporting the whole child and that it's not just about the math content. What else do we need to be thinking about as we're working with teachers across the region? Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to highlight something you know, internal to BOCES uh, that really we can think about how that's replicated across the region. And our BOCES prior to the pandemic um, actually hired some instructional coaches and some trauma-informed practices coaches. And those coaching teams work together to support the needs of students and teachers throughout our BOCES programs. And I think that model has been really powerful um, and, and that's really how we are looking at that to scale on a regional level, um, also in, in supporting our school districts. Wow, fabulous. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Doug, you're last on this question, but I'm sure not least, um, because this is the work that's really true to your heart and soul and um, your whole focus of the work that you do. So um, can you talk with us for a little bit about how you see your restorative work affecting both mm -hmm. academics and social emotional well-being? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first off, I just want to say like there's so much wisdom on this panel. I love uh, listening to the responses and answers. Uh, you can always learn from um, just, just everyone in this room. And so love hearing that. Um, I, I almost want to attack this question from like a, a macro lens as opposed to a micro lens. Uh, so, so we're all aware that learning loss uh, due to COVID-19 has been devastating. Um, and it's so apparent with the studies that have been out there. Um, and we have to do everything in our power to like get our students back on track. Uh, if there's one thing I know about students is that they're resilient. And I think that we, we can get them to that spot. We just have to find ways to pull uh, that greatness out of them. I think one of the most important things to remember, and this is a quote that, that goes back to this age-old question of, um, we can't do the Bloom stuff until we take care of the Maslow stuff. Uh, we have to be able to meet our students right where they're at, uh, bring down any walls that they have up, bring down the barriers, uh, build trust, give our students the supports and tools they need to be successful. I think that's the heart of restorative practices is building that trust, building those relationships. And that, that's the heart of SEL. I think that's the heart of any good teacher out there that cares about kids. And, and that, that's truly what it's about. Once our students, they gain that trust, they feel connected to their teachers, to the staff, to their peers, that's when you see the learning really start to flourish. That's the goal feel connected, build those relationships, and then we go deep into that learning um, and learning starts to accelerate. So uh, moving backwards before we can go forward, but I think we're on the right track. I really do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we put Ed Tomorrow link in there. Can you talk a little bit about your the work that you're doing with your your newly, I think a new company, right? Or is this a- Yes, yeah, it's uh, it, it launched officially last year. Um, uh, my business partner, John Whalen, who's a, a former principal at Whitney Point uh, and myself, uh, wanted to support our educators in the midst of, of COVID, in the midst of these challenging times. And uh, there's so much on our teachers' plates right now, and there's uh, constantly uh, to-do list. And what, what our goal is, uh, we want to remove something off our teachers' plates, and it's that planning for SEL that can kind of get in the way of uh, getting to their academics. And so uh, the, the goal of our company is we send out what we call the first five to uh, educators uh, re really across the globe right now. 
Um, and it is nine activities that teachers can pick from uh, to build quick and easy relationship for their students. Uh, it's called the first five because this is something that's so easy you can implement within the first five minutes of class. It doesn't have to take five minutes, it can take 30 seconds, but uh, just really quick, really easy strategies. They're brand new every single day. Um, and again, to kind of remove that workload off our teacher's plate so they can get into that, that important, important learning piece that we, we just discussed. So uh, it's absolutely free. Any teacher in the world can sign up for it. Um, you can kind of jump on that link, but again, it's about supporting our teachers and that's what, that's what matters. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you. Um, before we move on to just general responses, and I would also say anybody who is participating in this, I hope you found this interesting, but if you do have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat so we would have an opportunity to address them before our time is up, which is, looks like we're um, right on track with time, so that's a good thing. Thank you to everybody that's participating. Um, so anything else on this question, things that popped into your head, something you're thinking, hmm, I should have mentioned that before we just go on to general responses. Great, okay. So the last question is sort of uh, open-ended and um, we're all here because we believe in the power of community work. Any last thoughts about how together we can find a common purpose and positively impact our future? And um, the team at uh, Let Us Dream also came up with a, an interesting follow-up question just in case, but I thought it was one that might be worth um, us just thinking about too, is you know, if there is one action step participants can make um, to, to, to can take to make a difference. So um, either one, common, you know, about one I, I last thought or an action that someone might take. And Carrie, I hate to put you on the spot first. Um, obviously, you don't need to really answer this or just give us a brief thing. But what what do you think about last last words for this? It's been an amazing, amazing conversation. So thank you to all of you. I guess, you know, my, my lasting thought, and I'm just going to Piggyback on what Doug had said, there's so much wisdom here in this room, and I've learned a lot just from participating in this panel. And so to, to reach out, connect, try to learn from others, because everyone has something to offer. And if we can do this collaboratively together, we're going to be in a better place. Great. I couldn't agree more wholeheartedly. Thank you. Um, Matt, some final words, thoughts, actions? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go off on what Carrie just said. Um, Research tells us that um, you know, when they survey public school parents and they ask them what they think about uh, public schools in the nation, they overwhelmingly think negatively. But when you ask those same parents what they think of the schools their kids are going to, they overwhelmingly speak positive, positively mm -hmm. of it. Those two can't line up. Um, and the reason is, is because the national conversation is not what's the reality. And so I think, uh, as Carrie said, you know, reach out, being a part, um, getting into the community. And, and um, you know, my, my kids are in Binghamton. Um, and I've always said this, you know, they don't get the best headlines. Um, but I've, I have had nothing but wonderful experiences with every teacher my kids have been with. Uh, and I think that's because, um, you know, I stay connected with them. Um, so uh, to Carrie's point, um, you know, I do believe that education is a lot better off than, uh, than we're told it is. Mm -hmm. I would agree wholeheartedly. And I I can remember that statistic way back when I took uh, Larry Stedman's class. <laughs> we talked about that. And it's interesting that so many years later, the, the data is still showing the same thing. And schools are under fire a lot. And I think that um, the work that we're doing and even this conversation shows the depth in, of the knowledge and caring and collaboration is just amazing. So thank you. Um, next, we'll talk to James. James, some last thoughts, responses to what we've been talking about, some actions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I really enjoy, uh, thanks for making me a part of this panel. I have learned from everybody else that has spoken, like as everybody else has said. Um, a couple of things I wrote down that Doug said was uh, giving students a voice. Um, I think that's very important. It's also important to give the families a voice. Uh, to go back to that question that you'd asked me originally, Pat, about how do we um, and engage these families who might not be engaged with the school. It's just simply reaching out to them and saying, hey, hey, 
here to support you. How can I help you? Um, I mean, to this, just this morning, I had families reach out to me that I reached out to for the very first time um, about Thanksgiving baskets, and now they want help with something else. It's just simple reach out like that, saying you're here to help. What can I help you with? Um, it goes a long way. Um, you know, I think too much in these schools, it's an us versus them kind of concept where we're not all on the same page with these families, but just being there to help and show them that we, we are a team, this is a collaborative effort, I think goes a long way. Um, so it's just important work that we're all doing. And, you know, a big motto here in this building Matt, is the kids come first. So just doing what we can to help these kids and help the families. Um, I appreciate what you all, what everybody does. So I guess that'll, I'll end on that. <laughs> Okay, thank you, James. Doug? Yeah, I, I would echo what the other panelists have said. Uh, we're in this together. We got to work together to support our students. Uh, the system is fractured, but it's not broken. It's not too late. Uh, there's still hope. Uh, I think our kids need us now more than ever before, uh, but that requires some thinking outside the box, which, which is challenging. Uh, we're teaching to a different generation. I call it the TikTok generation. Um, and it's different. Their mind works differently. And so how are we engaging those, those students uh, when their needs are different than what our needs were as students? Uh, their futures are going to look completely different than what our current society looks like. Um, so thinking about our willingness to engage those students differently. Um, and ultimately, I think that can make a world of difference in today's learners. Okay, thank you. Joanne, last words. So I would just, um, you know, two, two points that were just made. One in, you know, what people's perception of uh, uh, public education is right now. And I, I think that all we can do is, is work in our own spheres to make sure that we're communicating all the time. And what's something that you used to say, Pat, you know, start with yes. Um, and that the school is our school, it is the community school. Um, and, you know, we're going to start with yes, and we're going to work with them. And it is essential for our students that we find ways to partner and be on the same page. Um, because yet we have our motto here too, it's kids are the point. And um, it, that's, that's the truth in all of this. Um, and that's where, where we're going to find the progress and, and getting back to the positive. The other thing I would just like to note, um, I have the um, honor of getting to know some of the students in the TLEL program um, in other ways, and they are just such an exceptional um, group of future educators, and there is such, such reason for hope for the future of public education um, based on those exceptional people and their enthusiasm, and they have grown up, you know, through all of this and are not phased by it and are just eager to impact um, children and our, and you know, our, our future citizens in really positive ways. So it, it is something that gives me tremendous hope and it should give everybody tremendous hope. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I don't see any questions, Joanne. I know you're there somewhere. Um, right, no ask, questions. No questions. So I hope that everybody found this uh, engaging, learning. Um, the panel itself, obviously, um, are people that I've known or are in the sphere of the work that I do. But I think that worked out so well because we got to hear so much about the power of collaboration and the brilliance of everyone coming together to do the same work, but in their own separate ways. So I want to thank you for joining the education panel and also to thank everybody on this team that um, I couldn't have imagined. We didn't practice, so it, but it was so cohesive because I think the work we do in our belief system and how we look at education is, is very cohesive. So thank you. Um, I think our time is pretty much up. I'm getting 11.29 on my, uh, on my, no, 11.30 on my uh, yes. right now. So I think our time is up. And once again, it was a pleasure and a privilege to be a part of this. Thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone for participating today. We're gonna be heading back to the main Zoom meeting. Um, to enjoy the uh, second keynote speaker. Um, you can please use the link in the chat. I just posted it in the chat uh, to join the main event. And uh, you can also use the same Zoom link in your calendar invite. Thank you.